All right, um, everybody, welcome in. I'm Dr. James Cellini. I'm a board certified veterinary neurologist. You might know that, you might not, but there it is. I am joined again for the second time, and right about one year later, it's uh, Dr. Lindsay Bullen, veterinary nutritionist extraordinaire. Welcome in. We need to talk about more things dog and cat food related and nutrition in general. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for having me today. And congratulations Good. for the year mark. Yeah, yeah. I made it a year. My YouTube channel is 10 x as Grant Cardone likes to say, and here we are. So um, maybe just a brief primer if you want to, I know we did this last time, but if you want to just introduce yourself and talk about uh, who you are, what you do, and we'll kind of take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as Dr. Cellini said, my name is Lindsay Bullen. I'm a board certified veterinary nutritionist, and I have the privilege of being able to do everything that I want to do. So in addition to education, which I include sounds nice. education, um, I know I'm, I'm so lucky. Um, I get yeah. to educate, I get to do CE. So I actually have um, a continuing education that I'm giving for the veterinary community. This Thursday. I love teaching. Um, and I also get to work at one of the, if not the best specialty practice in the country. So yeah. really get to do everything that I love. Yeah, um, that is awesome. So walk us through um, for the future veterinarians and vet students, or maybe, you know, young ish veterinarians who are thinking about going into this, maybe walk mm -hmm. us through like what your day to day or week to week job is like. Yeah, absolutely. Hospital. So Board certified veterinary nutritionists um, can kind of be placed in a couple different categories. Um, some of them stay in academia. And so those are the ones that are teaching veterinary courses. Uh, and I'll, I'll be honest, it's hard to make veterinary nutrition exciting. However, once you get yeah. past kind of that basic, this is a protein, this is a fat, it gets incredibly exciting because everything is a puzzle. How can we best support our individual patients, um, right. which is where I fell in love with it. Board certified nutritionists can also work in industry. So many of the reputable pet food companies employ multiple board certified nutritionists in addition to PhD nutritionists to ensure that the products they're making uh, contain all of the appropriate vitamins, minerals, you know, essential nutrients that your pet needs in the right proportions and concentrations. Now, and are then, you referring yeah. to big dog food? Oh, I am. That is correct. I am definitely referring to big dog food. So the major players, um, Purina, Hills, Royal Canin, even Blue Buffalo, um, and a couple of the smaller companies. So Instinct actually has a board certified nutritionist as well. Just Food for Dogs has a board certified nutritionist. Um, all of these companies that I've just mentioned employ somebody such as myself to ensure, again, um, that the diets are, are safe and efficacious and, and really, I should say, reduce the risk that they're not um, because we're human. And as such, you know, humans are fallible and mistakes happen. Happen, but the truth is having somebody such as myself and multiple somebody's uh, employed there really mitigates that risk so that we right. can optimize pet health. And then you've got just a handful of folks like myself who work in private practice. Um, and again, I'm super fortunate to work at this amazing specialty hospital. And um, in addition to myself, they also hired one of my amazing friends and colleagues, Dr. Luisana. So we are a two nutritionist practice, which is wow. amazing. Really, wow. really excited. And that, that would have to be pretty much mm -hmm. where a nutritionist, you'd, like you'd have to have a giant multidiscipline private practice mm -hmm. to work in private practice, I would imagine. Like, like, or am I wrong? Yeah, yes and no. So it's important uh, for folks that are interested in this to keep in mind that nutrition is never going to be one of those high producers like surgery, you know, or internal medicine. However, we are incredibly important in terms of augmenting and optimizing those services that they provide and really freeing up time so they can do what they do best. I don't know about you, but I don't really want my surgeon talking to me about homemade diets and they probably don't want to do it either. It's going to be excruciating no, I can, for everybody. I can <laughs> verify that I have no desire to talk about diet anything when I have a fat dog <laughs> with special diet needs or anything like that recovering. I right. 100% verify it. Exactly. So, so instead yeah. of you trying to tackle what to feed that back dog, you send it to me. And then that allows you to actually operate on more back dogs and help more yes. patients. So yes. we're really an ancillary service. Um, cool. 
so, you know, in terms of what I do every day, um, most of what I do right now is answering clients' questions via email, but really it's 100% communication. I communicate with my colleagues, I communicate with my clients, um, and I communicate with the general public in terms of what to feed, how to feed their pets. And the benefit of what I do is that it is truly a tailored approach. Um, I understand that every pet is a unique individual, um, and thus one size does not fit all. So I have the privilege when I work with a client one-on-one -on -one of truly being able to tailor that plan to that individual patient. Cool. Very good. Uh, it sounds like we need more of you from, I, from what I gather. Yeah. I, I would agree. I mean, the truth is yeah. we have 150 plus people on our wait list right now. And there's only two of us. That's crazy. Um, so, I mean, I, I wish that we had more people. And the truth is it, it takes... Um, it, it does take funding. Like I, I have to charge for what I do, but I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to overcharge. Um, so it really does take the support of an amazing hospital, um, such as the yeah. one that I'm employed at to really, you know, kind of buffer those costs. So I can still provide the service that our clients and our patients deserve. Yeah. I think you also as a nutritionist have maybe the most unique opportunity for like external consultation and expanding your, and kind of, dare I say, supplementing your income that way by doing that that's a probably a huge factor that's you know uh advantageous to nutrition um yeah. so wanted to get right into it um with some of the topics that i wrote down and i emailed you this earlier but um the, and these are things that people ask me like whenever i post <clears> on social media like hey i'm talking to dr bowen again what do you want me to ask her um it's a lot of the same stuff but everything needs to be updated. I think once a year when we're Absolutely. having a conversation. So does that mean that we're going to be talking once a year? Cause I would love that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I would, I would love that too. So um, where are we with the grain free diet entire situation? And if you don't mind maybe briefly summarizing it and yeah. where are we now and what should and shouldn't we be feeding these peas versus mm. legumes and bean and grain free and whatnot. So you can take it from there. Absolutely. So first what I'd like to make sure I point out for your listeners is that, um, or your viewers, I should say, um, is that there is no black and white. And I wish there was. Um, most people are turning to the experts such as ourselves because they want a definitive yes or no. And unfortunately, with many of these nutritional situations, there's very much a lot of gray. So I wanted to just, you know, start that as a disclaimer. Um, in terms of the grain free situation, Several years ago, um, and it was, I think, about 2007 or 2017, 2018. So it's, it's been a while, actually, at this point. Um, there was a population of pets that started developing a certain type of heart disease. And it was in a population that we don't normally see. So there is a certain, um, a couple of breeds that are predisposed to a disease called dilated cardiomyopathy. And that's when the heart muscle, unfortunately, gets really big. It kind of looks like a balloon a little bit. And the walls, which are supposed to be very thick, so they can contract well, as you stretch out, it gets thinner and thinner. So they, they can't do um, their job anymore. You basically have decreased heart function. So again, there are some breeds that are predisposed to that. But this disease started popping up in breeds that we really had not seen it in before. Um, so upon further investigation, uh, nutritionists, cardiologists, internal medicine folks, really anybody and, and general practitioners especially, started um, you know, submitting uh, information to the FDA and saying, hey, there's something going on here. Why are we seeing this uptick in breeds that we don't normally see it in? Um, and they came to the conclusion that there was a diet association. So one of the things that are important to keep in mind is that really the nutrient that has been pseudo implicated is taurine. Taurine is a non-essential amino acid in dogs. What that means is if they have all of the necessary nutrients, they can actually synthesize or make their own in sufficient quantities um, to support their heart function among other things. Now, again, kind of going back, there are those certain breeds um, that genetically have issues with taurine synthesis. Um, but in general, all of the new breeds we were seeing shouldn't have had a problem. So, so the question really was, is it a taurine deficiency? Well, no, because the dogs should be able to make it. So then you have to think about what are the precursors to taurine, um, which are methionine and cysteine. Those are essential amino acids. Okay. Um, I vaguely remember this biochemistry. <laughs> see, it's hard to make nutrition sexy. Um, yeah. <laughs> But, but the truth is that it's, it's still, 
really important to keep in mind that this is a multifactorial issue. It, taurine is not the only thing that contributes to heart health. It, it is a major thing, but there's other nutrients as well. And so really what it kind of um, boiled down to is that a certain type of food was implicated more often than other types of food, which again is why I'm, I'm being sort of vague because it's not black or white. And these right. diets tended to be enriched with legumes, um, which are higher in fiber. And they it's tended just, to- It's basically hard to control for all the different variables in these it diets is. to figure this out. Okay, go ahead. It is, yeah. And so, you know, so basically there was this huge to-do that grain-free um, was bad and it was causing heart disease. And I, I should say that the grain free is neither bad nor good. It, it just is right. <laughs> some pet, some pets do very well on it. Some pets don't need it and, and can do very fine off of it, but right. certain types of grain free diets, again, that had higher concentrations of, um, you know, legumes or, or non grain ingredients tended, uh, to be associated with pets that develop this heart disease. Right. So basically, you know, everybody said black and white, grain-free is bad, it's causing heart disease. And I said, well, certain grain-free diets could be causing heart disease, but not all grain-free diets are bad. Um, there are many grain-free diets out there that actually come from the reputable manufacturers that have been tested for safety and efficacy that are not causing heart disease. Um, so then again, that question is, is it because the formulation is bad? Is it because the ingredients are not playing nicely together? Do these pets actually have an underlying genetic defect? The other thing that I've noticed, um, which I, I'm sure everybody has, there is of course an obesity epidemic and many pet parents are taking matters into their own hands and restricting their pet's foods um, when the pet is on an over-the-counter maintenance diet. And if one does that, it actually creates nutrient deficiencies as well. Right. So if you take a diet that is not highly digestible, that the nutrients are not readily available for their pet, and then you calorie and thus nutrient restrict them, right. that could also cause heart disease because now they don't have the nutrients that they normally would. So again, right. it's, it is unfortunately multifactorial. And in terms of where we are now, um, we, we still don't have uh, you know a, a definitive cause. Um, I think the last statement from the FDA was updated maybe a year or so ago. Go at least the one that, that I had seen if yeah. they've updated it more recently than uh, I have not seen it. But um, I have noticed that many of the pet food companies that tend to use um, non grain ingredients have started augmenting their diets with extra amino acids, including taurine. Uh, so they're at least taking, you know, taking the situation uh, seriously and trying to head it off as best they can. Right. So what do you tell pet owners <clears throat> or pet guardians, uh, pet parents? I'm trying to use that terminology. I know that's pet owners is falling out of favor. Uh, but what do you tell people uh, who are concerned and they come to you and ask, what do I look for in, in a food? Like, what do I look yeah. for that's a red flag or not? What should I what should I do? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, first, I try to ask them, we, we talk about their pet and say, okay, what is going on? Are they healthy? Or are they not healthy? That's kind of the first step. Um, right. Then I try to talk with the client because we have to keep in mind, there is that, that pet parent or client perspective, right? Like I've got two clients, I've got my patient, then I've got the human that I have to work with as well and see what their feeding philosophies are. Even though nutrition is a science, um, there's a lot of opinions associated with it. And I, I try very hard to be respectful of my client's opinions as well. Sure. So once we kind of get down to that, if the client is adamant that their pet needs a grain-free diet for one reason or another, other, then I try to steer them towards a company, um, towards a reputable manufacturer that produces a grain-free product that has board-certified nutritionists, PhD nutritionists, the diets have undergone feeding trials, um, they've been tested for digestibility, safety, efficacy, all of those things. Um, so that's typically where I'll steer them. Some really good resources if you know a client is trying to do a little investigation on their own um, would be wasava.org, so the World Small Animal Veterinary Association, Pet Nutrition Alliance, um, is great. They have um, a, uh, a study they did called Dare to Ask, and they're actually updating it right now, where they reached out to companies to see if they would be transparent with information. So I usually send clients there and say, hey, let's see if, um, oh, thank you for showing that. Um, so yeah. there's the, the Dare to Ask. You can type in a lot of different foods and see what the answer is. Um, oh, so wow. if you if you click on the yellow thing right there, that should actually give you the search um, and then click here to compare your favorite pet food. There you go. So for example, what, what do you feed your pets? 
Uh, Hills Science Diet. Okay, so just type in Hills yeah. under brand name. Because they paid me eight hundred thousand dollars in vet school. No, I'm just when kidding. I, I know, right? Yeah. Um, so what you can see is that. Um, it, so the first question is: a contract manufacturer used? So yes, they are. So they're transparent there. Okay. Is there a nutrition expert on staff? Yes, there are. There are full time ACVN. So that's what I am. Um, and yeah. PhD and master's nutritionist. So you can see there's many many experts on there. Um, yeah, and do they? For everybody listening and watching, these are the types of experts you want to be looking for these letters right here. Absolutely. ACVN. Okay. Um, I will. Um, I do want to let you guys know that the ACVN college um, was recently integrated into the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. So oh, you yeah. did that happen see... since we last spoke? It did. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah, you're right. So, okay. So those letters might look a little different. Um, it might say uh, DACVIN nutrition, and that is the same credential. Gotcha. Um, and then you can see Hills owns the majority of their plants and they, they asked for a random nutrient and Hills provided the information. So they were transparent. Um, oh, cool. Whereas, you know, there are other companies that failed to respond at all or companies that declined to respond. Um, and I honestly don't know which one's worse, the one that didn't answer the email or the one that was like, no. <laughs> right. Very cool. It's kind so, of like when a movie comes out and they don't let uh, critics uh, review it and they just let right? it Right. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, well, uh, it's usually not good. Right. Um, um, moving on to the second topic, um, mm -hmm. the raw food issue. I always have to bring up. I'm going to bring this up. If we talk it once a year, I'm going to bring this up every year, probably for the rest of our career. <laughs> um, but has there been any change, any different thought process mm -hmm. you have in regards to the claims of raw food benefits? And how often are you formally recommending or working with uh, pet parents to? feed a raw food diet? Multiple yeah, that's, questions. There. Yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, so my philosophy is I will help any pet parent that is trying to help their pet, um, even if they are feeding raw. Uh, so if, for example, there's a pet parent that is uh, feeding a home cooked diet that they've created themselves and it's raw, I would rather make sure that the diet is complete and balanced and then counsel them on the potential risks associated with feeding raw than to just, you know, walk away and not help them at all. Cause at least I'm, right. I'm still helping. Um, and again, I'm educating on the pros and, and cons of feeding raw. So in terms of pros and cons, what are they? Um, the truth is there are no scientifically documented evidence um, uh, pros of feeding raw. We have to keep in mind that every single pet is a unique individual. And so, there are absolutely pets that I have worked with that appear to do well on raw. Um, right. That is likely due to the nutrient profile of the ingredients mixed together and less so due to the fact that it, it is raw or not. Um, that being said, there are certain raw ingredients that have a slightly higher digestibility compared to cooked ingredients, but it, it's marginally so. Um, and, and very uncommon for me to, to see that, at least in my patients. Right. So in terms of the cons, things that we have to keep in mind is that um, any sort of raw animal-based product and, and even some you know, vegetable-based products can be a source of bacterial contamination. And for me, as a practicing doctor in a very busy hospital where most, if not all of my patients are significantly immunocompromised, um, which means their immune system is at risk. I do not have the privilege of making that risk for my clients or for my patients. So this is kind of the one time that I, I am black and white. I personally do not recommend raw for my patients because I cannot put them at risk, even if the risk is 8% or 16%, um, right. which, which is important to note that those numbers are pulled from the Center of Veterinary Medicine from the FDA's study on commercial raw products. Um, right. they, they found salmonella and listeria, which can potentially be problematic. Another right. really interesting um, study that I had seen was in the UK. There was a population of cats that were fed a raw venison based diet and their pet parents got tuberculosis because the venison was contaminated. Right. Um, so we have to keep in mind that if, you know, in, in the small chance that the, the food is contaminated, it is not just our beloved pets that can get sick. It is also the human families that can get sick as well. Um, right. So really it, it comes down to public health. You know, if your pet is isolated, if you're isolated, if you understand the risks, then you are making an educated decision to, to choose raw. And Where you'll I, work with them. Like, and I, and I, not, it, 
I will not work like with you're them. telling them like, no, I don't do raw food, go somewhere else. Like, no, I, I will work with them. Absolutely. Yep. Right. A hundred percent. I will work with them. I will counsel them and say, Hey, so for example, I had a client one time and their pet was a service dog that went to visit the oncology wards and was fed raw. And I said, you can't do that anymore. Yeah. So <laughs> because you're putting that entire oncology ward at risk. Yeah. Um, now you're not at risk because you're healthy. Your dog's probably not at risk because your dog's healthy, right. but every single pet that your or person, I should say that your pet licks in the face to bring joy yeah. to like, could potentially be getting sick. Yeah, um, like and all your I can bone marrow is fine. Right. Like <laughs> exactly. And I, I don't know if you remember that scrubs episode from years ago where it showed kind of the contamination of the glove and it ended up like, you know, getting back to their favorite patient, but that that's what I oh. see. That is the risk. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that person um, really wanted to continue bringing their pet to the oncology ward. So they stopped feeding raw because they understood that their choice was actually having a much larger impact than they had thought. Um, yeah. So, and, and I was very grateful that they, heard me out and and thought about it from more of a global perspective rather than just this is my choice you know and it only affects me they they understood that it could have affected you know everybody else and so that's right. that's just what i counsel them you know if you've got elderly in the family if you've got kids in the family you know kids are terrible at washing their hands um probably not a great idea to feed raw um but you know again if the pet is isolated if the food um there's a couple of different methods that companies are now employing to try to reduce the risks. So high pressure pasteurization is one of them. Um, there's irradiation um, that can actually help with microbes as well. So if companies right. are employing these measures, it does reduce the risk. That's true. Here, here's my question. Why can't we just cook the food? <laughs> like, like, take the food <laughs> and then just cook it. It's oh, you mean like, like like the commercial food or just no? I just mean like or, take the raw food that you want to feed your dog, yeah, and just cook the chicken. Like, wh like, why is that not acceptable to people who only want to do raw food? What, like, what is the mm -hmm. thought process? I do, I do not know the thought process. Um, <laughs> I don't know either. I mean, and don't um, get me wrong. Like I love me some sushi. Like I, I yeah. take, I take that risk on myself. And I, I will tell you, my husband and my best friend had sushi the other day and both of them got violently ill and I yeah. didn't eat that particular sushi. And I was like, well, food poisoning. But again, that, right. that, that was the risk of eating raw. But, um, and and so they, I, I don't know. I, what I've heard from clients is that they, they wanted to feed their pet, like, like the wild, you know, brethren of, of your, if you will. And so they don't cook the chicken, but what I will often uh, share with my colleagues and my clients is that most of the wolves didn't have access to chicken. Um, you know, typically they were eating something else. And most of the time they were eating um, the offal and the byproducts and things like that first. So they don't typically go for the skeletal meat first because it's too tough and too hard to get access to. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of misconceptions about what um, ancient, you know, species would eat. Yeah, there's this uh, romanticization of things 500 years ago, like everything was just all natural and everybody was honky dory. But like, I pretty <clears throat> sure there was a lot of diseases that dogs dealt with that they don't deal with now, just like people. Yeah, I mean, and, that, and that's true. It's one of those things where I, I've got my super cape ready. I'm ready to, you know, fly in to save the nutrition day. But the truth is, nutrition very rarely cures diseases outright, but it absolutely helps to optimize a pet's health. And so when we think about a comparison to wild animals, most wolves in the wild only live a couple of reproductive cycles. Like that's their job is to right. have a couple litters of puppies and then they usually die by like four or five years old, um, okay. you know, because, because of illness, because of injuries, but also because of poor nutrition. Um, and same thing with wild tigers, you know, um, wild tigers are typically living to be about nine, 10, maybe 11, something like that. And we think about our cats and much to my husband's chagrin, my cat will probably live to be 22. <laughs> She's right. 15 right now. Um, you know, and so that's, something that we've been able to do is as veterinarians and as amazing pet parents is work together to prolong a good quality of life for our pets. But that also means not treating them like wild animals because wild animals aren't typically vaccinated. They're not typically dewormed. They're not typically getting checkups to find these diseases early and they definitely right. are not getting optimal nutrition. Well, I'll tell you what wild dogs were definitely not was <laughs> vegan at any point uh, in their history. Like there's no possible way that was true, right? Like, <laughs> like wild wolves. The, you are correct. Um, I okay. think it is. 
I, I, I never wanted. I, I, I was like, I never wanted to give blanket statements. Um, right, right. However, I'm comfortable I am, saying never, but like, it's, yeah. you got to draw the line somewhere. Um, yeah, you are, you that, are correct. I am not aware of any vegan wolves. Yeah. So that leads me to um, a study that <laughs> some people on my YouTube and uh, various other places. So this study that came out from the Center for Animal Welfare in Winchester, UK. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about vegan versus meat-based dog food, uh, guardian or pet parent uh, indicators of health. And I came across a study a couple of weeks ago and what they're basically claiming and all the news articles running with this are claiming that this study indicated that vegan fed diets are typically or lead to a healthier dog compared to conventional or raw meat diets. And I don't know if you wanted to go into some of the problems with this study that you saw off the bat. One glaring thing that I saw was that this is a survey study. They literally just asked the pet parents how you felt your dog was doing. And that yeah. was it. Like that was the, the judgment of health. Um, but I guess the more important, bigger topic here is what would you tell somebody who is asking you about vegan diets? Yeah. What to look for? Is it possible to do it from an, eth I get it from an ethical standpoint, like wanting to feed a vegan diet. Yeah. Um, but what would you tell somebody who's asking you about that and wanting to have a consult about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think it's important to note again, like I, I have worked with vegan pets uh, because of their, their vegan clients. So again, I will typically work with most anybody because my, my goal and job is to educate and then try to help them do it safely. So vegan, um, which again is going to be feeding no animal related products whatsoever, no animal related ingredients, um, can be done safely uh, in dogs. And it is incredibly challenging to do it safely in cats. Um, there are, I think there are a couple of vegan cat diets out there. I, I per personally ha have not had the opportunity to physically send them off to labs and analyze them. Um, but again, we have to keep in mind that there are very different species differentiations, especially with cats. Cats are obligate carnivores. That doesn't mean that all they have to have is meat. I hear that a lot too. They're like, okay, cats are carnivores, give them a chunk of steak. And I'm like, no, no, no. What that means is, <laughs> um, they are required to eat animal tissues to get all of their essential nutrients because they are not synthesizing them themselves. And there's, right. there's a handful of them and, and that's nutrition 102. So if you guys want to learn more about cat nuances, you can sign up for my classes. Um, oh, just, cool. kidding. <laughs> no, just kidding. Oh, okay. I was like, I thought you were about to plug something. I'm like, that no, 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 no. Um, okay. we'll, we'll do a whole lecture on cats. Um, but again, the important thing to keep in mind is that it, it can be done safely. It's just really hard. I yeah. have done one vegan homemade cat diet in my career and the cat projectile vomited everywhere because it wasn't palatable. Um, I know I was, and I was, and I told him, I was like, okay, this cat has to eat a ton of tofu. And I'm a little worried about the sodium, even though it's a low sodium tofu. And I had to throw in peanut oil in there to get its arachidonic acid. Cause you said no butter and all these things. And then the cat wouldn't eat it cause it looked and tasted like poo. Um, yeah. and so then we came back and I said, okay, can I, can I please just make your cat vegetarian or ovidarian or pescatarian or something? Um, right. and they're like, well, we will do eggs and butter. And I was like, well, thank Good. Um, so the cat ate that diet and it did very, very well. And, and they, they felt okay with it um, because there was no chicken that I'm aware of harmed in the making of the eggs. And, right. you know, the cows were not harmed in the making of the butter. Um, yeah. But again, cool. it's, it is just really, really challenging to do it safely because yeah. you have to keep in mind with pet foods as well. Um, it isn't just A ingredient plus B ingredient equals C diet. The ingredients and the nutrients interact. And so it's really, it has to go through multiple iterations to find out how the nutrients are actually delivered to the pet. Um, right. So it, it is not additive at all, which is why yeah. most of these products, if you take a look at the vegan diets, have tons of extra added nutrients because it's really right. hard to get it from just, you know, plain old ingredients. So you, right. I do agree in terms of sustainability. Um, I, I hope we can find alternate sources. I love that many pet food companies are looking into insect-based proteins now. I think that's incredible right. and wonderful and more sustainable. Um, but in terms of, you know, plant diets, it, it is it is really hard to get all of the essential nutrients. Um, right. So we have to add supplemental nutrients to the products. 
That makes sense. And then finally, we've got about seven minutes left. So I want to leave room because I know you wanted to plug uh, the website and the company that you're a part of at the end of this. I have not forgotten that. Um, <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to pull up one final thing here. Oh, one quick question before I do that. Someone Please. asked on YouTube, they keep asking me, um, uh, the best dental chew. Every I get so many questions about dental chews. I don't know if you have an opinion on that or not. Um, so for me, I do try to stick towards dental chews that are uh, manufacturers from some of the companies that undergo quality control testing and again, have scientists on board. So it typically tends to be, again, some of the bigger companies like Verbac. Um, but, uh, you know, really I've had clients come to me with random dental chews and I've evaluated them and they seem to work for their pet and not cause any harm. And Okay. You know, I'm like, okay, but typically where I'll go to is the um, Veterinary Oral Health Council website. Um, okay. And they have a list of all of the diets, all of the dental chews that um, have earned their seal of approval. And there's a couple different ways that they can earn the seal of approval, either by the abrasive factor. So it has to be abrasive enough and demonstrate that it's abrasive enough to um, kind of scrape off that plaque or tartar or from a chemical factor. Um, so if it's got certain chemicals, um, there it is. If it's got certain chemicals in there, it reduces oh, wow. the amount of calcium deposit. So there, there's an entire list um, that the VOHC has approved. So that's typically where I'll, I'll send my clients. I no idea that website even existed. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> no, wow. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, that is great. Um, and then finally, if we could spend like a couple minutes, I thought this would be a good exercise because I was actually buying food for my dog the other day. And I got to thinking about like the conversation we're about to have and putting myself in the mindset of anybody. Yeah. And I am looking at the ingredient. This is Hills. Like I was just looking at sure. the bag of Hills that I buy my dog. I feed him Hill science diet. And I'm looking through this and, you know, the first ingredient being chicken, but then everything gets, you know, brewer's rice, yellow peas, you know, I think, oh my God, wait, peas. Didn't they say this was bad and gave them, give some cardiomyopathy you know, what is all this? And then it goes into all these different vitamins and supplements and whatnot. So I, I guess my question to you is from the perspective of a non-medically trained person looking yeah. at this, like what are, what are they looking for versus like mm -hmm. any other brand? And I've got a cat food brand on the right. This is just cat diet. Yeah. So uh, yeah, if you don't mind leaving that up, I think this is yeah. awesome. Um, one of the things I wish uh, some of our regulatory colleagues did slightly differently, I won't say better, just differently, is putting things in a manner that not just the veterinary community, but also our, our pet parent community can understand. Um, it took six years of nutritional training for me to be able to look at this and know exactly what everything was. And, and that is unfair. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, is, it, it is unfair that somebody has to go to school for that long. And, and the truth is it didn't take six years to like learn the ingredients, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, it, it, it takes time and it takes effort to know what all of these things are. So what I tell clients, unless there is a food allergy from, for either the pet itself or within the family household, right. don't look, don't look at the ingredients because they're confusing. Okay. And, and really we have to keep in mind that ingredients are vehicles for nutrient delivery. They have a purpose and, and that is it. When I okay. look at this diet, I don't know the quality of the diet. I don't know the digestibility of the diet. I don't know the bioavailability or how available the nutrients are for the pet. I know nothing just by looking at the ingredients. I can tell you that every single ingredient on there has a purpose. Um, and, and if you want, we can go through together and I can tell you what they are. Um, I, but I don't think it, we have time. And I think the viewers yeah, it, it's a joke. substantially. <laughs> <laughs> However, what I tell clients is, and it's hard, but put your trust in the company. If you trust it enough to feed it to your pet, put your trust in it that every single ingredient has a purpose because ingredients yeah. are expensive. They are not going to put something in there that doesn't have a function because that is a bad business model. The other right. thing to keep in mind is they want your pet to thrive. They want your pet to live forever on their diet and have you be so happy that you exactly. feed all of your pets their diet for the rest exactly. of their lives. And for you to tell your family, your friends, your colleagues, everybody about how amazing this diet is. So, so taking shortcuts and killing pets is also a terrible business model. Right. And th these companies want your pet to do well. Um, right. And again, every single one of those ingredients, I promise, I wish they didn't use fancy names. Um, I love that they put, you know, ascorbyl 2 polyphosphate as vitamin C. At least they tell you what it is. 
Um, but I wish they would just put vitamin C in the first place. And instead right. of thi- thiamine, put B1. Every, you know, most people know what those things are, but it's right. hard. And, and I, yeah. I feel, I feel bad for people that, um, that look at that and feel frustrated and, and annoyed because I feel the same way. <laughs> right. Um, that is awesome. And then finally, if we got about a minute left, do you want to go ahead and plug you? The, the website you're a part of is awesome. I looked it up when you mentioned Yay. it earlier when I emailed you. I'll pull that up real quick. Awesome. Um, so yeah, the final minute is yours. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, so I just wanted to share with everybody that I am a part of an amazing group called Vet Scoop. Um, and their website is vetscoop.com. And it's basically a group of uh, veterinarians such as myself. Um, we do it for free uh, that are trying to bring accurate uh, and appropriate and, and realistic information to pet parents out there. We want to be the source that you can trust, honestly. Uh, so cool. there's, you know, we've got different media interviews, we have podcasts, we have blog videos, uh, all different specialties from, you know, all over. That scoop is an amazing resource for pet parents who are trying to get accurate information um, about veterinary related issues from the source from reputable veterinarians. So um, here you can see the the experts that are contributing. Obviously, I'm one of the contributors, but we have a whole handful of different types of specialists and general practitioners. So really, it's a good collaboration uh, between, you know, everything that is veterinary for you. Um, We have podcasts, we've got videos, we've got um, blogs, we've we've got a bunch of amazing things. And the important thing to keep in mind is that this is a work in progress. It's relatively new. So we are adding content almost on a daily basis. So definitely, you know, check in, check back to see what new additions we're adding. That's awesome. You guys need a neurologist by any chance? (laughs) I don't, I was like, I don't actually know if we have one. Yeah, I don't see one on here. I will definitely well, ask. Right. Yeah, I, I just, know a good one. You know, just let me know. Just let me know. <laughs> I'll let you know. Um, all right. So is there anything before we go, is there anything just summarizing general recommendations and info you want to tell pet parents in regards to feeding their, their dogs and cats or whatever? I didn't ask you about exotics, but yeah. just in general, any general <laughs> advice you would give people? Yeah. I mean, I think it's really important. Um, to keep in mind that, uh, you know, I, I understand everybody out there is trying to do what is best for their beloved pet. So maintain a, a positive, um, you know, trusting, mutually respectful relationship with your veterinarian. They are always going to be the best source to go to first with any questions whatsoever, whether it's diet or, or something else. If for some reason your veterinarian um, doesn't have the answer, which is perfectly fine, I would rather have my doctor say, you know what, I don't know, than yeah. to, to, you know, flounder around and make up a, a, you know, an answer. Um, but if for some reason your veterinarian doesn't feel comfortable with the, the answer or the question or, or whatever, then seek out a specialist, seek out a board certified nutritionist that can help guide you and your pet on their diet related journey. Um, yeah. Because again, our, our goal and our job is to try to optimize nutritional support so that it truly optimizes the quality and quantity of time that you have with your pet. But really important to keep in mind that, you know, healthy pets see vets too. So take your pets to the veterinarian to ensure that they are healthy and ensure that they don't need anything you know special, whether it's medicine or diet related. Very cool. Very cool. And any uh, way for people to contact you uh, either by email or social media that you'd like to put out there? <laughs> sure. So I'm actually terrible at social media, which is why I'm so grateful that I have amazing people like you that let me tag onto their social media. <laughs> I know um, I DM'd you a couple of months ago about oh, a, uh, so somebody made a YouTube reaction video to our first video. Yeah. And, and they sat there for, I think it's like a two hour video and they oh. just talked about how we're totally wrong. We're mistrained. And then they lit up the comments on the video on my YouTube channel yeah. about how Dr. Cellini's clearly mistrained. I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was nice. Um, yeah. I mean, that would be kind of heartbreaking considering how much money I spent on my training. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I do. Uh, exactly. Time, especially, and, and blood, sweat, yeah. and tears. I, I do know that there are some folks out there that wonder, you know, whose pocket we're in. Um, and the truth is, I take all bribes equally. No, right. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. I, I, I'm actually not employed or um, paid by any pet food companies. Um, I, I am employed and paid 
by my practice that I work for. Um, right. Now that doesn't mean that I won't go speak, but when I speak, it is on topics. It is not ever in terms of advertising a particular product. Right. So, so I am in no one's pocket. I am a free woman, if you will. Yeah. Um, that's a huge guy. I could do a whole podcast talking about like why people think vets are money hungry and all that. I would just I wish like they knew to how also much we say, made, right? <laughs> well, yeah, I would, I would just like to also say that if the big dog food brands are so evil, corrupt, and want to squash raw food innovation, right? Yeah. Don't you think they have the infrastructure to just make their own raw food and make it perfectly like what raw, what they claim raw food to be? If raw food is really the answer, or if evidence starts to come out that it is the answer, because I am open to that, right? Yeah. It's importantly, these companies are multi-billion publicly traded companies. They have the infrastructure to just do it. Like, they do. Yeah, they would. right? Yeah. But it's not like that's the reality of the situation. And, and, and I think no... it's because it's lacking, lacking evidence right now. Right. I right. am also incredibly right. open. Like if you can show me a well designed um, study that evaluates, you know, all different aspects, I will be one of the first to jump on and be like, wow, this right. is incredible. Now it is a safe option for my patients. Right. But that study does not yet exist. And the challenge right. is that with many of the raw companies, um, their, their uh, safety protocols are proprietary. So they are not willing to share um, the protocols to help advance um, you know, science in that regard, right. uh, nor are they willing to share protocols with one such as myself because there is concern that I'm you know, working for somebody in the back, which I am not. Um, right. But really, I want to know, is it safe and efficacious for my patients and clients? That is all I am interested in. So until right. I have that information, I have to err on the side of caution because it, it's a doctor's job to not put their patients or clients at risk. Um, all right. So I think we covered enough for our yearly <laughs> discussion. Um, everybody, if you don't mind hitting the like and subscribe button, leave a comment below. Let me know how I screwed up or let me know how I really did well with this interview. One of those two things is going to happen with the comment. So um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Dr. Bullen. Your time, you're so generous with your time. I appreciate it so much. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll talk to you on the next episode. Thank it you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me. See you next year. Thank you. All right.